Okay, so today we're talking about parametric equations. Uh, Okay, so the topic is parametric equations. So you have a handout for this. So let's first talk about what are the advantages of using parametric equations. You know, why in the world would we want to work in a different uh, method of graphing, a different coordinate system? You know, typically you have y equals f of x, right? Most of the equations that we work with, typically you have them of the form y is equal to f of x. But when you work with parametric, Typically, this is what it's going to look like. X of t equals, let's say, a function of like 2t. Y of t equals 3t squared. So typically, we have a set of equations, of x and y. So why would we want to do such a thing? It seems more complicated in the beginning, right? But here are the advantages for working with parametric equations. Okay. Advantage number one. It's very easy now to introduce a third variable, such as time. So if you have x a function of t, y a function of t, now you can also track where an object is at any given time t. So if, it's, if an object is moving along, let's say, a curve, y equals f of x, but there is no sense of time in that situation. But if you write it in terms of x of t equals something as a function of time, and y of t equals something as a function of time, then you can track where it is located at any given moment t. You know the x and y coordinates. So that's one advantage. Another advantage is that... Um, some functions are actually easier to graph in parametric equations. For example, think about a circle, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Typically, if you wanted to graph as a graphing calculator, what would you have to do? You solve for y, y is plus or minus the square root of the right-hand side, right? You have to enter two things to graph it. But in this, in, in this case, it's going to be so much easier. You just go to parametric mode on your calculator, enter x of t and y of t, just two equations. But you don't have to solve the equation usually for, um, for y. That's a little easier. Some other uh, advantages. They have a very natural extension to three-dimensional curves. As a matter of fact, in Calc 3, you're going to see this. Basically, to represent a curve in three dimensions, it's just going to be x of t equals something, y of t equals something, and guess what? z of t equals something. So then you can represent a curve, uh, uh, the path of, uh, of an object in 3D space uh, with these three equations. Uh, another advantage is that you can also represent in parametric equations the orientation and even the speed of transverse. So not only, like, when you graph something in, in regular coordinates, you have y equals x squared, it's just a graph that's not moving. In parametric, if I say x equals t, y equals t squared, and I set the parameters, t is from here to here, then you actually know from where to where it's moving, how fast it's moving. Um, we're going to be, be doing some graphs in just a little bit, and you'll see how you can indicate orientation on a graph. Orientation meaning the direction of motion. And also, you can do some very sophisticated things, like the graphs that you see at the bottom of your handout. Each of those have been done with parametric equations. Now, imagine graphing something like this with Cartesian, y equals f of x. First of all, it would not be a function, right, it, because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. But with parametric, it doesn't have to be a function. So you can get very creative graphs. Uh, you can use them in design. I was even told that parametric equations are used in the design of uh, fonts in laser printers, because you can actually use these equations to design uh, the shape of a, of a curve. It doesn't have to be a function. You can, you can get more creative with them. And I was told, again, that they were used to use um, for fonts uh, in, in laser printers. Okay, now let's also take a look at what is it that exactly I want you to know from this section. Uh, this is not in your handout. Please just take a look at this one. So these are going to be our goals as we cover this section. We're just going to have time to cover the highlights. So I want you to be able to understand the advantages of using parametric equations, which we just went over, right? Uh, you know how to graph parametric equations using point plotting or eliminating the parameter method. We're going to do examples of that today. So graphing parametric equations. Also doing some calculus with parametric, finding the derivative, the y dx of a function given in parametric form. Don't worry about second derivatives. The book gets into that also. We're just going to do first derivatives of parametric equations. And also number four, find the arc length. And if we have time, maybe a little bit about even surface area for something that is given in parametric form. So these are the goals. And let's begin by the uh, second one, graphing a parametric equation. So starting this point, this should be your handout. So in the beginning, if we don't know any better, we're going to graph by by point plotting. We're going to pick some points for t, and we're going to graph them using point plotting techniques. But then we're going to get some better ideas uh, as we go through the section. So let's begin 
if we don't know any better, we begin with point plotting. So since t is between 0 and 1, let's just do a chart here. t versus x and y. Now, of course, you can pick as many points as you like, but this appears to be a linear function. If you only have t, no t square, no ln t, or things like that. So usually to graph a linear function, only two points are sufficient. So I'm going to pick the initial t and the final t, so 0 and 1. So in each case, can you tell me, for example, if t is 0, what is x and what is y? If t is 0, x is 3, and y is 0. If t is 1, what is x? and y is 2. Now let's go ahead and graph those two points that we obtained. So the points we're going to plot are x versus y. So 3 comma 0 for the first one. Right here, 3 comma 0. And the other point is 0 comma 2. Just right there. So now you would join a line, joining them, but go in that co correct direction. Go from t equals 0, so this was at t equals 0. This point was at t equals 1. So we're just going to join those. Uh, you, know, you could plot more points, obviously, but we know this is going to be a straight line because uh, 3 minus 3t or y equals 2t, all these things were linear functions, just t to the first power. And which side should I put my arrows here? Uh, from 0 to 1, exactly. So make sure when you graph your parametric equation, you indicate the orientation as well. So this is the orientation. It's going from, from that point at t equals 0 to the point on the y-axis t equals 1. So this is your graph in parametric. Now, there is another way to do this one also, and that is by eliminating the parameters. So I'm just going to put here or. You can, you can also graph and This technique is going to be helpful for things that are not straight lines. Because straight lines, all you need is two points. But what if you did not have a straight line? Then you need to plot a lot more points. So this technique is helpful. It will cut down the number of points you have to plot. So, eliminate the variable. That's eliminate the parameter. That's the technique it's all about. So, which one is easier to solve for t in these two equations? Which one would be easier to solve for t? Y. So, y equals 2t. So, from here you get t is equal to y over 2. So, now take that information, plug into the first equation. x equals 3 minus 3t. Three so, it will be 3 minus, instead of t, I'm going to put its equivalent, which is y over 2. So basically, this is what we have. x equals 3 minus 3y over 2. But that doesn't look like your standard equation. What would you do to make it in standard form? So right now, we have x equals 3 minus 3y over 2. So what should we do to put this in standard form? Any thoughts? How about multiply everything by, by 2? OK, so 2x. Multiply both sides by 2. So we have 2x is equal to 6 minus 3y. And then typically we put the x and y's on the same side. You can leave it like this. 3y plus 2x is equal to 6. This will be one way to leave it as an equation of a line. Of course, you can also solve it for y if you wanted to. You can also leave it like this. y equals uh, negative 2x plus 6 all over 3. So negative 2 thirds x plus 2. So there we have the perfectly good looking y equals mx plus b, the equation of a line, right? And um, But if you graph it now, if you follow the second method that we're doing here, the method after the or, if you follow that method, you get the equation of a line. But this line technically goes through the entire coordinate system. This will be your line. It goes all the way across. So you still have to eliminate from where to where is it going. So it's going to, you will say, well, if t equals 0, where are we? You will still have to plot that point and plot the other point, t equals 1. So you have to basically cut out the rest of that line. You still have to finish with the same line as we got earlier. But at least this is giving you the general shape of the line. And then you still have to plot at least two points to see the orientation from where to where it's going. And so you can also put the borders. Uh, you know, you, we don't want to take the entire line uh, when you're graphing in parametric, unless if they say it's going from negative infinity to infinity for, for t. OK, so let's do the second one. Let's graph and provide the orientation for the given parametric equations. And one second, how do you know that this is even parametric? The trademark of parametric is 
It has x equals a function of t, y equals a function of t. So this is the easiest way to think of this is an object is let's say is moving along the x y uh, coordinate system, and t is time. So now you can also track at any given time t where is, is it located. So this is clearly a set of parametric equations, and. And again, you could do point plotting, of course, on this one, but I'd like to begin with this one by eliminating the parameter because this is not linear, so two points is not going to do justice to it. And instead of blindly plotting the points, I'd rather first see the generic shape, and then we can decide which points to plot on it. So, um, let's eliminate the parameter here. So, if you solve for t in this equation, what do you get? t is equal to x over 2, right? And then plug that into the second equation. So what do you get for y? y equals x squared over 4 minus 1. Basically, the quantity squared, the x over 2, because t was being squared, and we get this. Now, what kind of a graph is this? So you already have an idea about the general shape of this graph. This is a parabola, right? Uh, what is the vertex of this parabola? You know, x, if it was just x squared minus 1, it would sh shift the x squared graph one unit down. And what does a 1 fourth do to the graph? Does anybody remember from algebra? It makes it like more wide. You know, if it was 2x squared, it would be more narrow. Uh, so basically, uh, move it one unit down. And if necessary, you know, if the graphs get complicated, you can also use, of course, a graphic calculator at this point. But this one is not so complicated. So basically, we have a graph that opens up crossing the y-axis at 1. But this is for not for the parametric. This is for the Cartesian graph. But we have some restrictions. T has to go from 0 to 4. And because it's parametric, you also have to put the orientation on the graph. So this is just a general skeleton, but we need to finish it up. And to do that, let's just at least uh, plot two points. So I'm going to do T versus X versus Y. So if T is 0, what do we get? X is 0 and Y is negative 1. I'm going back to the original equations to get my x and y. And what would you plot for your next t here? Right, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you could plot 1, but I'm going to go with the last point, which is t equals 4. That will show me where this curve ends, where this motion represented by this parametric ends. So I'm going to plot, uh, plot uh, 4. And what do we get there? Uh, 2 times 4 are 8. And plug 4 in there, we get 15. So basically, um, we're going to take this curve, but only from 0, comma, negative 1, which is this point right here, through the point 8, comma, 15. So it's going, uh, it's not up to scale here, but it basically keeps going up to the point here where we have 8, comma, 15. And because from t equals 0, it moves from, from that point to that point. So this is the point t equals 0. That's the point t equals 4. So put the arrows then. The arrows are going to be in this direction. So, and the rest of it we can actually erase. So this is the graph. It starts there. It goes to that point. And the rest we don't really need. So if you wanted to, you can just go ahead and erase that. Or what you may want to do is if you're doing, you know, in your paper, uh, just draw the skeleton very lightly and draw over it dark in a dark color. Um, just go over it one more time to finish the graph to show the final what, what part of it is accepted for the given question. Now, sometimes this gets a little bit trickier than this. And I want to give you an example about what I mean by that. Uh, Let's do x equals the square root of t, y equals to 1 minus t. This one has a little bit of twist to it. This is not in your handout. Can you graph and provide the orientation for the following set of parametric equations? x equals the square root of t, and y equals 1 minus t. Again, because this is not linear, I... I I may need to plot more than two points. So I'd rather get the skeleton of the graph first, the shape, and then I can go back and decide on the orientation. So uh, what would you get for t here? If you solve for t in, in, in this equation, what would you get for t? x squared. And plugging that into the other equation here, y equals 1 minus t, which will be 1 minus x squared. What kind of a graph is that normally? 
parabola that opens downwards, right, because of the negative x squared, it's been shifted up by one unit. So technically, this is what the graph looks like. And for this question, uh, they did not give us any restrictions on t. They just said, graph these parametric equations, x equals square root of t, y equals 1 minus t. They gave us no restrictions. But we need to think about when you eliminate the parameter t, sometimes you have changed the equation a little bit. Uh, so we need to decide, is there any restriction on x and y as given in the original equation? So for this x and for this y, is there any restriction? So can x, for example, take on any negative values? x is equal to the square root of t. Can x ever possibly be equal to a negative number? No, square root of 9 is always going to be positive 3, right? This is principal square root, right? So because of that, there is a restriction. Whereas y is the 1 minus t, y can assume any value. Uh, but what should I do right now? If x is equal to the square root of t, that means x always has to be greater than 0. That's a restriction on the domain of the function. So what should I eliminate then from here? the negative side. So I should only take the positive side. And what about the orientation? I, I have this habit of, you know, wrapping in Cartesian coordinates, putting that arrow, but we should not automatically put that arrow. We should decide which way this graph is going to go. So for that one, you can pick any two values you like. For example, we can pick t equals 0 and 1. It just makes easy easy values to select. And again, we're going to track the x and y accordingly. If t is 0, what is x and what is y? x is 0 and y is 1. Yes, question? Yes, because x was defined as a square root of t, and the square root of a number by definition is always going to be a positive number. Uh, so if you ever put in your calculator square root of 16, or as long as it's a real number, it's always going to be a positive number. That restricts x. x can only be positive because it's defined as the square root of something, and square root of something can only be a positive value. Okay. And if t is equal to 1, what do we get? x is 1 and y is 0. So that means at t equals 0, we started at the point 0, 1, which is this point right here. And then it's moving... Um, towards 1 comma 0, which is right here. So basically this, this takes the entire right-hand side branch of the parabola, and that's the uh, orientation. It's moving downwards, basically. Okay, now there are some very famous parametric equations. For example, the circle has a very fa famous parametric representation, and that's our next example. Let's take a look at it. So when you graph parametric equations, if you eliminate the variable, always do a quick check. Check the domain and range, making sure that you know uh, there's no restriction on those. And if there is, represent it in your final graphs. Okay. So the question says, graph and provide the orientation for the given parametric equations, x equals cosine t, y equals sine t, for t between 0 and 2 pi. Now, many of you are taking physics, right? Have you seen this in physics? Uh, and does this remind you of something? What kind of a motion is this? X equals cosine t, y equals sine t. Do you recognize this as maybe circular motion? And if you don't, not to worry, because we can, we can actually show it very easily. How can you show that this really represents circular motion? Well, uh, how would you go about eliminating variable t here? It's not that easy now to solve for t, because you have to apply cosine inverse to both sides, plug it in. But let's take advantage of some trigonometric identities. What do we know? There's a very famous identity that relates sine and cosine. Which identity is that? Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, right? So let's try to make use of that identity to get rid of the t. So basically, I'm going to write these two equations right underneath each other. x equals cosine of t and y equals sine of t, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to square both sides. So x squared equals cosine squared of t. And y square equals sine square of t. And how will I eliminate the variable t now? How can I make use of that identity? What should I do to these equations? Add them up. Exactly, because we know that if we add them up, t will magically disappear. So we're going to end up having x squared plus y squared equals to 1. 
And does that equation look familiar to us? That's the perfect equation for circle centered at zero, zero, right? With a radius of how many units? The number on the right hand side represents r squared. In this case, r squared is one and r is one. So, but uh, this, if you just represent this in the Cartesian coordinate system, it just represents a circle sitting there. It's not doing anything. Okay? When in parametric, it's more exciting. Things are happening. There's a motion that is being represented. For example, they said uh, x is this, y is this, and t is between 0 and 2 pi. So the object is going around the circle probably only one time, right? And in which direction is it traversing the circle? Let's again do a quick, uh, quick analysis. If you start at 0, t versus x versus y, uh, I'm going to do 0 and pi over 2 in this case. At 0, what do we have? x, what is cosine of 0? 1, and sine of 0 is 0. And let me just, to be, I just want to see as I go from 0 towards 2 pi, you know, you can plug in any other value, but I don't want to plug in 2 pi because that will probably give me the same point back. So I'm going to plug something in between, say pi over 2. If pi over 2, what is uh, x? Cosine of pi over 2 is zero and what is y sine of pi over t is one so this object is going to move from from the lower t to the higher t values meaning from this point towards this point so the first point was one comma zero right here and the other point is zero comma one right here so it looks like it's more moving in a counterclockwise direction then it's going to end at two pi so it starts at zero and ends at two pi so it's going to go over the circle exactly one time so when you just write that x squared plus y squared equals 1, it's a circle, but nothing is happening to that circle. It's just sitting there. But when you represent it as x equals cosine t, y equals sine t, where t equals between 0 and 2 pi, you're representing the motion of this object around the circle. And you're seeing how many times it's going around it. In this case, exactly once. If I put 0 to 4 pi, you know it went around it two times, obviously. OK, now can you change it just a little bit? Do a little bit trial and error for me here. And answer the second question we have up here. Can you write a set of parametric equations? Can you use the same ideas here, play with these a little bit, so that now you, the object is moving in the clockwise direction. So one idea was to make both of them negative, but now you're going to start at negative 1, 0, because cosine will become negative also. Um, what would be another approach? If you want to start at the same location, although that, that really answers the question, because the question didn't say, where does it, is it going to start? It just said make it go in the opposite direction. But if you want to start at the same exact point, then what could you have done there? So which one would you make negative? Uh, right. If you make the sine, so these are some possible ideas. We can make x equals cosine of t. And let's say y equals negative sine t. Because if you make both of them negative, that's also going to work. It's just it's not going to start at 0, 1 anymore. Uh, you know, if that was a goal, uh, the question didn't specify that. So I think either one would be acceptable. You can make both of them negative. Uh, so in this case, if, I, if we just make the y negative, then what are we going to have? Where is this going to start for us? At t equals 0, what is x, what is y? x is still 1, right? Cosine of 0 is 1. And what is y? So it's still starting at the same point, but let's say we pick pi over 2. So cosine of pi over 2 is still 0, but negative sine of pi over 2, that will be negative 1. So that will force it to go in the other direction, right? So you still have our circle, but this time it's going in this direction. Again, there's more than one answer to this, but that would be one possibility. Now, this circle was centered at 0, 0, and the radius was 1 unit. Next, we're going to take a look at the general equation for a circle. And I, I've actually given it to you in that handout, the general equation of a circle. And here I have in the, in the big, big bubble here, remember that in Cartesian coordinates, the general equation for a circle is x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared, all equal to r squared. So the question is now, how, how, how could you adjust it so you, you have the same thing in Cartesian, uh, rather in parametric equations? So the last equation with the center was 0, 0. The claim is the following. The claim is that this 
set of equations is going to represent a circle in more general format with h comma k being the center. Can you help me prove this? Can you help me show that x equals h plus r cosine t, y equals k plus r sine t is actually going to end up giving me this? In other words, how would you eliminate the t so we end up showing that this is really the correct equations for circular motion, not centered at necessarily zero, zero. So I'm going to re rewrite those. x equals h plus r times cosine t and y equals k plus r times sine t. How would you go about eliminating t here? And your hint is, use the same process used in the last example. How do we go about eliminating t in the last example? We try to somehow square both sides. We somehow try to do that, right? Uh, we, we try to use the identity sine square plus cosine square is equal to 1. Well, um, what, what should I do first? So I'm going to try to use that, yes. Uh, what should I do with the r? Okay, before I can take the r out, what should I be doing? Tim? Get the sine and cosine by themselves. And I think that's what you're trying to say, but what would be the first step to do that? First, exactly. First, subtract the h and the k. So we have x minus h. x minus h is equal to r times cosine of t. And on the other one, we have, sometimes I have a delay factor happening with my pen today. So um, then y minus k is equal to r sine t. Okay, at this point, uh, you can square both sides, right? So, and then add both uh, those squared quantities. So, the first one would be uh, x minus h quantity square equals r squared times cosine squared. And the other one will have y minus k quantity squared equals r squared times sine squared. And what do I do now? Add them up. So how are we going to get rid of the T in there? As I'm adding the right hand side, I have R squared cosine squared plus R squared sine squared. As I'm writing it down, what can I do? How about taking out an R squared from both of them? So now that I'm going to have R squared cosine squared plus sine square, which is one exactly. That's the item that we tried to use because we know that will eliminate the variable for us at C. So this whole thing is one. And voila, there we have it, right? X minus H quantity square plus Y minus K quantity square equals R square. So that is um, the equation of a circle as we know it. And we have shown that in parametric, if you start with this, you're going to end with that. So indeed, those equations that are in the box here, it did give us the equation of a circle centered at h comma k with a radius of r units. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I'll come back to this one in a minute. Let's go to the next slide and do this example. Find the parametric equations for a circle centered at 2 comma negative 1 and with a radius of 3 units. And based on what we just learned, what, what is it going to be? And in the, if you're asking for parametric equations, you, your answer should be x equals something, y equals something. That's the typical uh, way to leave a parametric equation. So what is your h and k here? This is your center, right? So this is your h, this is your k, and this is your radius. So now it should be easy, right? This is your radius. So what, what should x be? h plus r cosine of t, right? Our h is 2 and our r is so what should I be writing? 2 plus 3 cosine t. Basically all you have to do is look back to your uh, equation that was in this box here. That gives you the general formula which we have proven. So we're just using that result right now in this example. So x equals 2 plus 3 cosine t and y equals negative 1 plus 3 sine t. So 
Also, converse, if you see something like this in perimetric, just know that it represents a circle. And by just looking at this, you should be able to tell me what is the center of the circle and what is the radius of the circle. Do you see that by look, if I just give you those two pairs of uh, equations, okay? And what I will skip a moment ago, I'm going to leave that as part of your homework, which is, so you do the same thing we've done so far as, as this equation above, but this time to get the equation of a, an ellipse, show that x equals h plus a cosine t and y equals k plus b sine t will give you the equation of an ellipse uh, centered at h comma k. And let me just remind everybody, what is the equation of an ellipse typically? Uh, x minus h quantity square over a square plus y minus k quantity square over b square is equal to 1. This is your typical equation of an ellipse. And one thing I didn't mention up here is when we derive this equation, but remember, this is a circle. It should also give, uh, give you an orientation. If, if t is going from 0 to 2 pi, it's going to be just like we saw in the past. It's going to go that way. If the center is at 0, 0, we've already seen this was the standard orientation. So technically, each of these also come with an orientation uh, because it's a parametric. It's not just a Cartesian equivalent. So what I'm asking you to do is show that this set of equations is going to give you that one by eliminating the parameter t. Do you already see how you would go about doing that? Very, very similar to the last example, basically. Okay. Instead of squaring it right away, like we did over here, first divide by a and divide by b both sides, and then square them. That's your hint on that one. So do that and ask me a question about it if you, if you have a question about it next time. But right now, let's just use that result. So what is the parametric equation for an ellipse that is centered at 0, 0 and satisfies this criteria? Length of major axis is 6, and length of minor axis is 4, and assume major axis is along the x-axis. That's usually the assumption. Oh. So the major axis is along the x-axis. The length of the major axis is 6, so it's going to go plus or minus 3. And if the minor, length of minor axis is 4, uh, So it's going to go plus or minus two units. So roughly speaking, we're talking about this ellipse. So what would be the equation of this ellipse in parametric equations? And look back to that box that we just had in the other page. First of all, the center is at zero, zero. So your h and k are going to be zero and zero. So where you have a cosine t, what should we have right now? What is our a? Uh, a will be just 3. So it will be 3 cosine t. And for the y, it will be 2 sine t. And if you had any doubts, you could definitely plot some points to graph this. Where is this going to start at? If t is 0, where would you be? If t is 0, you have 3 times cosine 0, which is 3, and 2 times sine of 0, which is 0. So you would start right here. And just like in the other circle example, we can plot another point to show that it's going in this direction. As long as t is between 0 and 2 pi, that would give you one, one traversal around that ellipse. So do you see the main difference between an ellipse and a uh, circle in parametric? In the, in the circle, both cosine and sine have the same coefficient, right? In a sense, it's the same amount of stretching towards the x-axis and towards the y-axis. For an ellipse, um, those numbers are typically different. So it's showing how much is going to be stretched along the x-axis, so how much is stretched along the y-axis. Yes. Uh, which, which equation? No, this is another problem, Dan. Starting down here is a different question, yes. What we have really is we're using the one from the previous page, the bottom of the previous page. Right. That's a good question because that one, the other one on that page, is going to be a hyperbola. 
So basically, these are the equations for an ellipse, and that's what we use in this next page over here. So what you had here, really starting at the beginning of another question, and maybe I should have kind of moved it down so it doesn't confuse you guys as you're doing the other one. Okay. Okay, and this one also I'd like to give, give you guys as, as part of your homework for next time. Uh, the question is, can you eliminate the parameter? Uh, but you know what? I do have a typo there, which I'd like to fix. Where it says sine t, can we change that, please, to tangent t? Because when you have secant and secant and tangent, there's a nice identity uh, that relates them. What is that identity that relates secant and tangent? 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared, right? 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Therefore, secant squared minus tangent squared equals what? Secant squared minus tangent squared equals to 1. So, you know, and let me remind everybody what's the typical equation for a hyperbola. If it's centered at uh, 0, 0, your hyperbola would be like this x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals to 1. And typically, this hyperbola would open along the x-axis at plus or minus a. This is a and this is negative a. So your job is to use this. And what if it was not centered at 0, 0? How would this equation change if it wasn't centered at 0, 0? Instead of x squared, you would have x minus h squared, and instead of y squared, you would have y minus k squared. So your job is to use these equations and to show that from there, we can get to this, especially the one with x minus k and y minus, uh, x minus h and y minus k in it. And I'm giving you the hint how you're going to do that. You're going to use this equation. Try to get them like we did with the circle in such a way that you end up squaring both sides. But this time subtracting, so you want to use uh, the identity secant squared minus tangent squared is equal to 1. Okay. So how are you going to begin doing that? How are you going to begin this one? If you're trying to go from here to there. Uh, any thoughts? First, subtract the h and the k like we did before. Then divide by a and divide by b square everything, and this time instead of adding, you're going to be subtracting because you want to use secant square minus tangent square identity. Okay. And that subtraction is going to give you something like this at the end there. Okay, so these are some standard parameterizations for a circle, an ellipse, and a hyperbola in parametric equations. Now, there is also a parameterization for a line. Okay, so let's also take a look at that one. Okay, they gave us a standard parametrization of a line that connects the points x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2 is as given. Uh, first of all, our job is to prove that this is really the correct equation of a line in, uh, in Cartesian coordinates. So how could you tell me, what is again the equation of a line in regular coordinates that we're familiar with? The equation of a line is y equals what? mx plus v. That's very well known, right? y equals mx plus v. So somehow uh, we want to show that. But there's another version which we also end, end up using. y minus y sub 1 equals m times x minus x sub 1, correct? Okay. So if we end up with either one of those, uh, we're, we're going to say, okay, we got it that, that these equations really represent a line if we can end up with one of those. Now, if we don't know any better, you're trying to get rid of, you know, the pyramidic equations, you're trying to end up with Cartesian coordinates, look how we've been doing so far. How, how can we go about going from the left side to the right side, from this to this? One of them has, um, and for this one, you can assume x1, y1 is given, x2, y2 is given. So the only unknowns are x, y, and t in the first one, and, and the other one only x and y are the unknowns. So how can we go about going from the parametric to the, to the Cartesian? 
solve for t for one of the equations like we've done before. Very good idea. Let's do that. Let's solve for t in this equation. So what I'm going to do is first subtract x sub 1. So x minus x sub 1 equals t times x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And then how can I go about solving for t from here? Divide. So t equals... x minus x sub 1 divided by x2 minus x sub 1. And what do I do with this now? Plug into the other one. So here we have y. Um, and I'm going to put the y1 on the side as I'm writing this. y minus y1 equals. You didn't have to do that right away, but I'm trying to save some space here. On the right-hand side, you have t times something. For t, I'm using the new value we got, which is x minus x sub 1 divided by x sub 2 minus x sub 1 times, what am I missing? So we put the t in there, right? So all of this was placed in for t because we got t equals this from above. So what, what else should I be writing? Exactly, y2 minus y1. Now, at the moment, this looks nothing like what we were trying to get, right? At the moment, this looks like a big mess of uh, letters and so forth. But can we rearrange things a little bit somehow so that we end up with what we're trying to get, which was this? Can we rearrange things? Look at the right-hand side. Is there a way to rearrange things on the right-hand side? Excellent. Does anybody see what Nikita saw? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. If we put it together, that represents a slope, right? Difference in y over difference in x. So we can, we can do that. Let me get some extra space here by moving these down. That was brilliant. Okay, so we're going to do exactly that. Uh, if you just realign things a little bit, if you rewrite this, I'm going to keep the x minus x1 as it is, but I'm going to put everything these two together, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And then this side is y minus y1. So the suggestion was to replace all of this quantity by what? This is the same thing as what? Slope, m. So do we have it now? Definitely, y minus y1 equals m, which I can put up front, m times x minus x sub 1. So indeed that... What they gave us earlier, it, it does represent the equation of a line in parametric form. So I'd like to give you a few moments then to solve uh, this part, because we've already done that part above. We eliminated the parameter t. So now can you put it in action in, in this example? Find the equation of a line going through 1, 4, and 5 comma negative 2. Can you find the parametric form of the equation? And you're going to use obviously this right here. So how do we do this? So our equations are up there. I'm going to write them one more time. For equation of a line in parametric form, x equals x sub 1 plus t times x sub 2 minus x sub 1. And as you can see, the equation of a line in parametric form is not going to be unique. Depending on which two points you use from the, uh, from the line, your equation may look a little bit different. But that's okay. Still, it will represent the same, same line. Um, just like you can pick any two points to get the slope of that line, um, you know, those that will change the equation a little bit. y equals y sub 1 plus t times y sub 2 minus y sub 1. So if I call this point x sub 1, y sub 1, and this point x sub 2, y sub 2, then the first equation will be x equals 1 plus t times x sub 2 minus x sub 1, or 5 minus 1. And the other one will be y equals y sub 1 plus, which is 4 plus t times y sub 2 minus y sub 1, which is negative 2 minus 4. 
in simplified form, I can say x equals 1 plus 40 and y equals 4 minus 60. So these represent the equation of the line that goes through the given two points. And could you graph this? Sure, you're going to plot two values, 4t, t equals 0, t equals 1, and you can show the orientation from which, uh, and this will, will end up going from uh, towards from top to bottom. So you can definitely graph this. You know the two points on the line. You have a rough uh, idea of what the line looks like. And um, because there's no restriction on the value of t, it's going to be the entire line. You just have to go ahead and put the orientation on there. Uh, so go ahead and plot it. So the two points are 1 comma 4, when x is 1, y is 4. And the other point is 5 comma negative 2. So we're talking about the entire line, no restriction. And again, to get the orientation, start with plug it t equals 0. You're going to get the first point, 1 comma 4. And then uh, plug it t equals 1 or any other value is moving in this direction. So that's your complete graph there. So we've done um, a circle in parametric. Yes. There's always going to be two equations. Anytime we talk about parametric, it's always going to be x equals something, y equals something. That's the trademark of parametric. And basically, um, those two equations represent this line. And not only that, it's representing a motion along this line. And the motion is moving towards uh, from top to bottom, like it's going from the higher points to the lower points. So we're done circle. Uh, we look at an ellipse, a line. Uh, as you can see, you know, a line maybe is not all that easier to work with in parametric, but a circle, an ellipse, those are actually much easier to work in parametric. The equations are much easier and easier to enter. Because think about it. If, you're, if you have something like this x squared over y squared plus um, this x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals to 1. To graph this on regular coordinates, you have to solve for y. y equals the square root of this. y equals plus or minus the square root of something. You have to enter them each separately. In parametric, it's a lot easier. Uh, it's two equations, but it's already uh, a h plus a times cosine t uh, k plus b times sine t. It's just so much easier to enter them into the uh, calculator. Yes. Uh, no. Because we automatically got, the question was saying, find the equation of the line in parametric form, and we found it. It didn't even ask us to graph it, basically. We could have stopped right there. Yes. Okay, now we're going to do some calculus with parametric equations, because like I said, everything up to this point was technically a review of parametric. We didn't do any calculus with them up to this point. We just got familiar with parametric equations. So now we're going to look at um, a few formulas um, from calculus. The first one is, how do you find slope on a parametric equation, which is dy dx? Well, the answer is very, very simple, actually. You can write dy dx as dy dt times dt dx. So dy dx is the same thing as dy dt times dt dx. Would everybody agree with that statement? It's as if the dt's are canceling, right? And now you can rewrite this as follows. You can put the first one on the top, dy dt. And instead of having times dt dx, could I put that in the bottom as dx over dt? Yes, and why am I doing this? Because usually it's hard to get dt dx. You need to know, know t in terms of x, which we don't always have. But if you write it like this, it's much easier. Uh, so dy dx is just simply, you take the derivative of the y coordinate with respect to t, and divide it by the derivative of the x coordinate with respect to t. And we'll look at this in a minute, but let's first do an example. Uh, we'll look at number two in just a minute. So for instance, um, let's do the next example on the next page. Find the slope of the tangent line to the given parametric curve at the given point. The curve is given by x equals cosine t and y equals 3 sine t. At the point t equals to pi over 2. Okay, so to find the slope, typically what do we do in calculus? 
the derivative, right? Typically, you want to know the rate of change of y with respect to x, the instantaneous rate of change, right, which is dy over dx. But because it's given to us in parametric form, you know, yes, one way is you can eliminate the parameter, get in terms of y in terms of x, but it's going to be messy, and then you have to impose a differentiation to get dy dx. Who needs that, right? Instead, you can use what we have. What we have is parametric equations, and we can differentiate right here in parametric form. What we just learned says to find dy dx, you need to do dy dt and divide it by dx over dt. So what does that mean for this equation? So what is dy dt for this function? The derivative of 3 sine t with respect to t. What is that? 3 cosine t. By the way, judging from the last test, a lot of people forgot how to take the derivative of something like this. Let's say sine of 2x. How do you take the derivative of that? A, a, a lot of people forgot that. It's not just cosine 2x, right? It's 2 times cosine 2x because the chain rule says multiply everything by the derivative of the inside, right? That's just a quick reminder there. Okay, and what about the derivative of dx dt for the denominator? What is that? Negative sine t. And we want to know the slope at the point pi over 2. So let's simply plug in pi over 2 for t, and let's see what we get. The top is going to be just 0, right? Cosine pi over 2 is 0. The bottom is going to be negative 1. The answer is 0. Basically, we're saying that the slope at that point would be 0. Yes. Pardon? Negative, sure you could, sure you could. Negative uh, 3 cotangent t and then plug in pi over 2 into cotangent, it will still give you pi over 2. Yes. Okay, there's another example here about the equation of a line. Um, could you work on these two examples, please? So again, just a clarification here. Uh, this is supposed to be y equals 1 over t plus 1 on the side. So to find the equation of the tangent line, we need the slope first, right? Uh, the slope of the tangent line is the derivative, right? So to find the slope of the tangent line, we're going to need to find dy dx. And we just learned, just given in parametric form, just find dy dt divided by dx dt. And in this case, dy dt is, what's the derivative of 1 over t plus 1? That's negative 1 over t squared. And the derivative of, the, uh, the derivative of t minus 1, that's just 1. And we want to evaluate this at the point t equals 1. So what do we get? Negative 1. Now, we also need a point on the line. If t is equal to 1, what is x and what is y? x equals 0 and y equals, we're plugging 1 for t in here and 1 for t in here. So we get y is equal to 2. So when the point is 0, comma 2 and the slope is negative 1, now we can write the equation of this line, right? So we have y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. Yes. Uh, we plug in t equals 1 into here, right? Uh, we got x is equal to 0, right? And we plug t equals to 1 into this, we got y is equal to 2. And now we're simplifying it. So y is equal to negative x plus 2. So pretty much the same idea here, right? So we're going to find the slope. And once again, we want to do, keep them in the format it is in. Instead of converting it, eliminating the parameter, just keep it in the format. Then slope equals so dy dx, which is dy 
y dt divided by dx dt. For this function, dy dt is the derivative of the tangent function, which is secant square of t. And what about dx dt? The derivative of secant is secant times tangent. And then one of the secants will cancel. So we're left with secant t on the top divided by tangent t at the bottom. And how do we simplify? We need to do this at pi over 4. If you want to at this point, you could plug it in. I'm going to simplify first, but you could plug it in at this point, really. So secant is the same as 1 over cosine. And you're dividing by tangent. So tangent is sine over cosine. So the same thing as multiplying it by cosine over sine. So now that we get rid of the cosines, we have 1 over sine t. And we want to evaluate this at t equals to pi over 4. First of all, what is sine of pi over 4? Or 2 over 2, also known as 1 over the square root of 2. So now you're taking the reciprocal of that. That will be simply the square root of 2. Again, because sine of pi over 4, it can either be written as 1 over root 2, also it can be written as root 2 over 2, but in this instance I'm using this one because I need to take the reciprocal of it, so it's easier to use in that format, reciprocal is just root 2. So we have the slope, and what about a point? At t equals pi over 4, what is x and what is y? x is going to be secant pi over 4, right? which is 1 over cosine pi over 4. What is that going to be? 1 over cosine of pi over 4. Square root of 2. And tangent of pi over 4, this one is easy, right? Tangent of pi over 4 is sine and cosine are equal. The ratio is 1. So there we have our point. The point is root 2, comma 1. The slope is root 2. Can we write the equation of the line from here? We should be able to write. So y minus the y coordinate equals the slope times x minus the x coordinate. We simplify it. Root 2 times root 2 is 2 plus 1. So it looks like we have y equals radical 2x minus 1. Anybody who got that far before we do? Yes, question? It is, it is. And usually I use that version, sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And right now, 1 over sine of uh, pi over 4, I would have to write 2 over square root of 2. Then I would have to get the you know, rationalized denominator. To avoid all of that, I use its equivalent because sine of pi over 4 can also be written as 1 over the square root of 2. Yes, because technically it's, it's 1 over root 2, but then they rationalize the denominator. But, but not to worry, because if you go with this one, you take the reciprocal of it, you'll get the same thing. It's just going to be a little bit messier. You have to simplify it. So you, you could put uh, 1 over, uh, you could put like 2 over root 2, which will simplify to root 2 anyway. Okay, one last example, but this time we're going to use that other formula, that other formula that we had, this formula, and what does that formula represent? It represents the arc length of the curve given in parametric form. Do you guys remember the arc length formula in regular equations like f y equals f of x? If you had this, y equals f of x, the arc length was the integral of the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared. Right, this is if you have it in, in regular form. If you have it in a parametric form, and if 
if you recall, this is basically f prime of x is dy dx squared. So this, this kind of is reminiscent of that formula. And it's actually, uh, there is a very simple derivation. So if you take a little piece of, of this arc length, and if you call that um, delta s, you know, this side is technically delta y, this side is delta x, and the arc length is really the square root of delta y squared plus delta x squared. And basically we're integrating it because we're doing it over so many little intervals. But how did this equation become that? How did this equation become that? Basically what they do is in parametric form, they multiply and divide us by delta t. They multiply and divide it by delta t because they want to integrate with respect to t. Then the delta t goes inside the square root as delta t squared. And then you end up with delta y over delta t, which is dy dt. That's your derivative. And then the other one is dx dt. So it's, it's actually very easy to prove, but I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to do the proof. But if you're interested, please see me after class on that one or see your textbook on the proof. But right now, we're just going to use this result. This is the arc length formula when you're dealing with a parametric equation. And we're going to use that formula to to do this example, show that the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. That has to do with arc length, right? Circumference of a circle is the arc length around the circle. And that other example in your handout, I'm going to leave it as part of your homework. That's the one about this one. Find the arc length of the curve cosine cube of t uh, and uh, y cosine cube of t. That might be part of your assignment that you're going to turn in. So make sure you do this one. Okay, this is the last example in your handout. This is going to be a little bit messy. I'm giving you a little warning there, but uh, you can handle it. I know you can. Okay, so right now we're going to do the easier one. Uh, show that the circumference of the circle is 2 pi r. How could I start this one? Circumference of the circle is 2 pi r. I'm going to make use of parametric equations here. What is the equation of a circle in parametric form? If the radius of the circle is r, what is the equation? And you can cheat. You can look back a few pages be, uh, before what we did earlier. What was the equation of a circle in parametric form? X equals. It's, now, let's assume that the origin is going to be the easiest way to do it. Good. Somebody remembers from the beginning of the class. X equals R cosine T. Does everybody agree with that? And Y equals R sine T. If it had been an ellipse, it would have different, like A and B in front, right? For a circle, it's the same amount in the x direction, y direction, so r and r. Okay, this is the equation of, an, uh, of a circle centered at 0, 0 with radius r units. So we're trying to find the arc length around the circle from 0 to 2 pi. So let's say that zero, t is from 0 to 2 pi. That, that way you traverse the circle only once, and that's important in arc length and parametric. You want to traverse the curve only one time. 0 to 2 pi will do the job. Okay, the arc length formula says the following. The integral of the square root of dx dt quantity square plus dy dt quantity square. dt. So in this case, under my radical, I'm going to have a square root sign. What is dx dt in this case? Differentiate this in with respect to t variable. What would your answer be? R is a constant. Negative r times sine t. This is the derivative of the first one, right? Has to be squared. What is the derivative of the second one with respect to t? R cosine t, and that has to be squared. Now, can you simplify that for me? We have r squared sine squared plus r squared cosine squared under the radical. And I can take out the r squared. Which is our sine squared plus cosine squared part is 1. And my t should be from 0 to 2 pi that will ensure that we're traversing it once around the circle. So what do I have under the radical now? This is 1, as you have pointed out. This is 1. 
the square root of r squared, which is r. Technically, it's the absolute value of r, but r is really its only positive quantity, right? So it's r going from 0 to 2 pi. And if we integrate with respect to t, what is the integral of a constant r with respect to the variable t? r times t. Very good. And evaluate it from 0 to 2 pi. And what do we get? 2 pi r. Is that the, is the circumference of a circle? Yes. So isn't that pretty cool because it's so much easier when you work with parametric. Remember you had a test question or a review question like this? It was so much more work when you stay in, in Cartesian coordinates. So in parametric, some things are really easier. And I'm going to give you a quick hint on that last question because I'm so nice. I'll take like half an hour on this one, okay? X equals cosine cube of t. <laughs> How would you differentiate that? Because you're going to need to differentiate it. How? Because you need to look at it like this. This is cosine of t to the third power altogether. What is the derivative going to be then? 3 times cosine of t to the second power, which is cosine square of t times the derivative of the inside, which is negative sine of t. So you can see things are going to be a little bit messier here, but they're going to simplify a lot, okay? It, it's, it's going to be an integral you can do by hand. You're not going to need a graphing calculator to finish that question.